Welcome everyone to our virtual chat for the celebration of women and girls in astronomy. Hello, I am Lucinda Offer, Education Outreach and Events Officer at the Royal Astronomical Society, which encourages the study of astronomy, geophysics, and space science. This year, the RAS is delighted to take part in the International Astronomical Union's celebration of women and girls in astronomy with this live stream of 30 minute chats highlighting some of our amazing RAS women fellows. And just to let you know, we have had numerous great talks by women and on women astronomers over the years. A couple to note are Women of the RAS by Dr. Mandy Bailey and Women and the Stars by Dr. Helen Cluse. We also have a three day live stream called The Weird and Wonderful World of Uranus with University of Leicester PhD student Emma Thomas, who allowed us to learn more about what astronomers do while we observed her collecting data about the aurora of Uranus, all from the Infrared Telescope Facility atop Mauna Kea, Hawaii. And all can be found at the Royal Astronomical Society's YouTube channel. And if you haven't seen it yet, the RAS also released its bicentenary timeline. We made sure it highlighted many of the women astronomers who contributed to astronomy over the last 200 years. It is available via our website and on Instagram, and we hope you will check them out after our chat with our current guest, who I'm delighted to say we have with us today, Dr. Olivia Harper Wilkins, who is an astrochemist, artist, and a NASA postdoctoral program fellow, also called an NPP, and she's at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, where she does experimental work to understand interstellar ice chemistry. Her undergrad degrees were in chemistry and mathematics, and her PhD was at Caltech, which focused on observational astronomy. I will have Dr. Wilkins tell us more in a bit, but first, a quick note that we will try to make time for a short Q&A at the end. So please post any questions by clicking on the Q&A icon in the Zoom uh, I am, um, interface. Thank you everyone for being here and thank you, Dr. Wilkins, for being with us. Please tell us more about your successful story of daring to be unqualified. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here today to talk about my journey um, and trying to do things that I might not be qualified to do, at least on paper. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, my journey and give examples of, of how I've done this along the way. So my name is Olivia. I am a laboratory astrochemist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. So NASA is the American Space Agency, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And I'm located on the East Coast of the United States right now. And what I do as an astrochemist is I study molecules or chemicals in space. And this includes what they are and what they're doing, how they're interacting with each other, how they're interacting with things like starlight um, and with interstellar dust. I'm also an artist. Um, so this is a digital painting that I did of the bug nebula. Um, I also enjoy uh, doing other types of um, art like acrylic painting. Um, he, these two are pieces that I have featured in an art show right now in Anne Arundel County. Um, I do watercolors um, and I do a lot of other things like embroidery, uh, wood burning, etc. And this is something that I was never trained to do. It's just something that I've done for fun, but I have made it part of my career. Um, and when I was younger, I felt like I couldn't be a scientist and an artist. I felt like I had to choose between the two. So this is why I mention it to show that you can be both a scientist and an artist if this is something that you're interested in doing. Um, so I mentioned that I made this a part of my career. I use it uh, for science outreach. Um, but I also last summer published a book with the American Chemical Society. Um, not only did I write the book, but I did a lot of the illustrations myself. And that's something that I never thought that I would do. Um, I It was like a wish list item, um, but I actually made it happen uh, last year. So I'm really proud of that. Um, but right now, I'm doing some sublime space science. Uh, specifically, I'm working on this experiment that is called sublime. It's the sublimation laboratory ice millimeter submillimeter experiment. Um, so you can see uh, the experimental setup behind me. Um, and uh, what this studies is um, how different chemicals are interacting on ices. So sublimation, in case you're not aware of this term, is the transition from a solid to a gas. So usually when we think of going from, let's say, water ice, solid water, to water vapor in the air, um, we think of it melting first into liquid water, and then it goes up um, through evaporation into the air. But in the low pressures and temperatures of space, you have a process called sublimation, where you just skip that liquid phase altogether and you go straight from the ice to the water vapor. The millimeter, submillimeter part of this refers to the wavelengths of light that I'm using to study. 
um, the the ice, specifically the gas that comes off of those ices. Um, and what I do in this work, or what I will do, because I just started, um, is I'll make cosmic ice analogs. So I'll make something that looks like um, ice on interstellar dust or ice on comics, comets. I'll irradiate those ices with UV light. So UV light comes um, uh, is something that you might be familiar with, like from the sun. It's why we wear sunscreen and sunglasses, because um, it can be harp harmful in large quantities. Um, but this is something that's prevalent in interstellar space um, and throughout star formation. So the chemistry that we have in star formation is going to be subjected to UV light. So we do this in the lab. We subject our ice samples to UV light. We watch how the ice changes over time. Um, and then we also study the gas that comes off of that ice. So this is where the sublimation is. Um, after it sublimates, we study to see what products are formed or what, what new chemicals are formed. Um, so uh, while I'm doing laboratory work right now, and even though I have a chemistry background, um, I feel really unqualified. And on paper, um, I look pretty unqualified um, in terms of I don't have any prior experience doing this kind of laboratory work. And I haven't been in a lab for five and a half years. Um, so I'm doing laboratory experiments now. But during my PhD, which was in chemistry, um, I was doing observational work with radio telescopes, so specifically um, ALMA or the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array in Chile. Um, and this uh, is a drawing that I did of, of ALMA on the screen. Um, and then before that, uh, I did my bachelor's in chemistry and math. And while I was there, I had no astronomy coursework. So I went from having no astronomy background or no formal astronomy education to doing astronomy work to then doing laboratory chemistry. So I've kind of been all over the place. Um, geographically, I started off in Pennsylvania and my entire journey thus far, thus far has been guided by radio telescopes. I really love radio telescopes. Um, and in the background uh, behind the map is a picture of Alma. I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania, uh, New Oxford, Pennsylvania. And I didn't know what a PhD was. Um, no one that I knew was a scientist, um, I, but I was really interested in science. My parents took me to a lot of museums, um, especially history museums, and I was so fascinated with the engineering of things, how machines worked, um, and I always had this interest in being a scientist. And part of the reason was because every time I went to the library, I picked out this book called Volcano, The Eruption of Mount St. Helens. So Mount St. Helens is a volcano that's on, that's in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. And um, it had a major, major eruption, I think in the 1980s. Um, and uh, it's a really famous eruption. And I was just fascinated by this book. Um, and I checked it out just about every time I went to the library and I thought I wanted to study volcanoes. I wanted to be a volcanologist. I thought this was so cool. Um, I guess this is the closest thing I had to seeing um, what scientists did um, was through this book. Um, but when I was seven, I saw what looked like a giant satellite dish thing in West Virginia. And the satellite dish looks like this. And it's not actually a satellite dish. When I was 18, I learned that it's a radio telescope that explores the invisible universe. It collects radio waves from space, from star forming regions. I um, mean, it helps us understand things that we can't see using what you probably think of as a telescope. Um, and not only did I think that the whole exploring the invisible universe thing was cool, but this thing is so huge. So I have some pictures to show you the relative size. So the Green Bank Telescope or GBT is 148 meters. Um, so that's taller than a uh, clock tower in London. Um, and it's not quite as tall as the Gherkin, but it's pretty close. So if you can imagine seeing this giant satellite dish in the middle of the mountains, um, it was just amazing. And I, I loved it. I hope to do something with it someday. That year, I also started at Dickinson College near where I grew up, and I still knew I wanted to be a scientist. I didn't know what kind, so I decided to study chemistry because chemistry is considered a central science. I figured if I wanted to do archaeology or volcanology, like there was some chemistry that was present in those fields. So I decided to study chemistry, and then I also studied mathematics because math is fun. Um, so that's what I did. Um, I also did some chemical ecology research, so I studied chemicals in creek water and tried to understand how pavement on parking lots can pollute our local water systems, but I still kept thinking 
about this idea of exploring the invisible universe with the GBT. So I was curious and I just decided to apply to be a summer student. So when I looked at the ad, it said that they were looking for students who are interested in astronomy, people who have a background in astronomy, physics, or engineering, and someone who would be doing a research project in astronomy research, instrumentation, um, telescope design, software development, all types of things that I had never done before or like never even heard of for the most part. Um, so I, I didn't tick off a lot of the boxes, but even though I didn't tick off the boxes, I had some other things that I think benefited my application. So I had lab and research skills from chemis chemistry courses that could be transferred over to doing research in an astronomy setting. So even though I never did astronomy research or had no astronomy prior knowledge, um, I did have some growing research skills. I also had some background in calculus and proof writing or mathematical logic. Um, this is something that I didn't really advertise during my application, but when I started at Green Bank and I started to write code for the first time, I realized how useful that math background was. I also had strong writing and communication skills, so you can do all of the scientific research you want in the world, but it doesn't matter if you can't share it with other people. Um, so that's a skill that i had that wasn't explicitly stated on the on the advertisement and then i also had creativity and problem solving skills so um you need to be a creative thinker and you need to troubleshoot shoot a lot of problems during uh during research so i had those things and i think that those are the things that helped me get this position even though i had no previous knowledge of astronomy so the first time i applied i was rejected but the second time um i had a successful application so when i was 20 i was a summer student at green bank observatory and uh, i loved it so much i didn't really do much research but i learned how to code and i also realized that yeah i really do love radio telescopes um, so after that i wanted to see more radio telescopes so i decided to study abroad in the uk actually um, so the following year, I, sent, I spent the spring semester in the UK at the University of East Anglia. Um, and the whole reason why I did this is because I wanted to go visit Jodhra Bank. Um, and I did, and it was fantastic, and I absolutely loved it. Um, I don't know if making big life decisions like this based on wanting to see a telescope is advisable, um, but it's a lot of fun. Um, so that's what I did. And when I came back, I spent the summer at Harvard. Um, the previous summer at Green Bank, I had attended a talk where they talked about astrochemistry, and I was blown away that I could combine this love of telescopes with my chemistry background. Um, so I really, you know, even though I wasn't doing anything at Green Bank that um, relates to what I do now, at least not directly, um, it was an important opportunity because it taught me about this whole new field that no one at my university knew about, I hadn't known about, um, and that's what I'm doing now. So I encourage you to try new things and do things outside of your comfort zone because you might find things uh, that really interest you, like I did with astrochemistry. So when I was 21, I spent the summer at Harvard. Um, this is the building I was in, and I was using radio telescopes to understand chemistry, and I really liked it. Um, so I decided that's that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do astrochemistry. I wanted to use telescopes, but I also had this chemistry background um, and I felt a little guilty about not being in the lab. I was also interested in learning about the laboratory side of astrophysics. So after I graduated from Dickinson um, when I was 22, I decided to move to Germany. Um, and I was a Fulbright Fellow in the Cologne Laboratory Astrophysics Group in Germany. And what we were doing there is building a database of the chemical fingerprints that radio telescopes, um, telescope observations use to identify the chemicals in space. So I was working on the other side of the database that I had used while I was at Harvard. Um, I lived in Cologne, which is famous for this cathedral. Um, as you might guess, it's also near a large radio telescope. So that was part of the motivation for going is um, being near the Effelsberg radio telescope in Germany. Um, I worked in the physics building. And while I was there, I also had a baby. My husband and I had gotten married right before moving to Germany. Um, and at the end, uh, I had a little German living souvenir. Um, so his name is Goonie and he follows me on all of my adventures since then. And um, after that, uh, 
at when I was 23, I began grad school on the West Coast. So I moved about 3,000 miles in the opposite direction from where I grew up to Caltech or the California Institute of Technology. And there I studied chemistry. But even though I was a chemistry student, I did all astronomy research. So I mostly studied the Orion Climb and Lone Nebula or Orion KL. Um, this is the picture of the Greater Orion Nebula. And I used ALMA, this telescope in the, in the background. I also had lots of fun. Um, visiting different national parks. I enjoyed the desert. It felt like being in a movie, which was really cool. Um, and I also went on some observing trips. So I went back to Green Bank, Green Bank, and this is when this picture was taken, when I got to go to the top of the telescope. Um, so the dish below me is about 100, meet, yeah, 100 meters across. Uh, I've also dragged my son around and turned him into a radio telescope enthusiast. So here is him at two years old, excitedly pointing at the GBT. But throughout all these experiences, um, I sometimes felt like I was really unqualified to be doing this work, but I was trying to do it anyway. Um, so I specifically, I felt unqualified for obs observational astronomy graduate work. You know, I was in a chemistry PhD program. I had no prior astronomy coursework, um, and I had no telescope proposal experience. So when you do observational astronomy, you have to do a lot of writing and trying to convince people to give you time to use their telescopes. But I um, had some research skills. So again, a lot of the skills that I, was, that I had used in the lab were transferable to what I was doing with my telescope data. I also had some astronomy knowledge from research, and I could also take graduate courses um, so I could catch up on the astronomy knowledge that I'd been lacking. And I also had communication skills. I enjoyed writing. So I, I love writing telescope proposals. I don't like hearing back about them. Um, fortunately, I've had um, you know, enough success to finish my PhD, um, but I find the process of writing really enjoyable. So that's a great thing. Um, so these are all things that even though on on paper, at least at the beginning, I didn't seem like someone who should be doing astronomy in graduate school. Um, I really did have the skills needed to be successful there. So I recently finished grad school. I'm 28 now. I finished grad school uh, in December, so just a few months ago. So I'm a newly minted PhD. Um, and then just last month, I started my fellowship at NASA. Um, and again, even though I'm I'm here and I'm here successfully, so someone thought that I met the requirements to work at NASA and to do laboratory astrochemistry. I haven't been in a lab for five and a half years. I've also never worked on space ice chemistry, neither in the lab nor um, in observation. So space ice is completely new to me. But what I do have are good ideas, or I like to think that I have good ideas. I had to write a proposal to get this position. So someone liked my ideas. I also bring an observational perspective. So in a way, my um, lack of, of experimental expertise gives me a perspective that helps me um, guide the experiments so that they're most useful to observations. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, um, why my advisor decided to offer me the fellowship um, is because I can provide this new perspective. So sometimes your lack of qualifications can actually be an added asset. So what I'm hoping you take away from this and what you take away from my journey um, is that at every step of the way, I tried things that, at least on paper, I didn't really seem to meet all of the qualifications. So I want to encourage you um, to not count yourself out just because you don't think that you meet the listed qualifications. Um, there are always going to be people who don't meet all the qualifications and they're still going to apply. So the only the only thing that you can guarantee is that you won't get a position if you don't apply. So you might as well apply um, and hopefully it'll it'll work out. I also encourage you to try new things. I never would have learned about astrochemistry, what I'm doing now, if I hadn't just been like, oh, you know, it would be cool to work with a telescope. Like, I wonder what that's like. So don't be afraid to go outside your comfort zone. It's really scary. Um, and you'll probably have lots of failures along the way. And that's certainly what I've experienced, but it's been really rewarding um, to try new things. So those are the slides that I have, but um, if anyone has questions, I would be happy to take them now. 
Yeah, we definitely can uh, take questions. There's a Q&A icon on the Zoom interface if you're joining us with Zoom. Um, fortunately, we're not taking questions on YouTube, but if you'd like to submit a question for Dr. Wilkins, you're more than welcome to. I, am get, I think I have my camera on now. <laughs> um, how are you, Dr. Wilkins? Thank you so much for sharing that with us. We do have about nine minutes that we can have a nice little informal chat here if you have some more time to um, share some of your insight with us. Absolutely. I think it's so amazing. I, this, I was really looking forward to you um, contributing to this because, um, you know, there's so many things out there that are available to women, but I don't want, I wonder how often they apply, you know, and I always try to tell when I do uh, talks to students here, it's like, just apply, 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 you know, don't, don't be afraid to apply. And even if you, like you said, you don't, tick every box. I think that might come naturally for some, a lot of people um, to just go ahead and apply. But for, for me, at least it didn't. I always felt like I had to have every single qualification that they're asking for before I could even apply. I didn't have the guts or I, I, and if I'm honest, I still, that's still in my head um, that, uh, oh, that's not, that's not for me. They don't want me. I wonder, do you have any advice like how to get over that? <laughs> I, I think you just have to do it once. Um, I mean, I think like the reason why I keep applying for things that seem really risky and like I, I don't tick all the boxes is because of that summer in Green Bank. Because as a chemistry student, I was accepted to do astronomy research. So I feel like after that, it's, that seemed like the most extreme deviation from from chemistry for for a chemistry student. So that's something that I still reflect on now. That's probably the most important experience that I've happened that I've had happen in my life so far. Um, so like when I was applying for um, for this fellowship at NASA, this is something that I was telling my friends. It's like I don't know what I'm doing, but like I feel like if Green Bank took me as a chemistry student, like I I must have some chance here. Um, so it might be something, at least for me, where just doing it once um, it is enough to, to, to shake that. Um, but it, it does require a lot of, of guts and being vulnerable um, and sometimes admitting why you're not the ideal candidate. Like I think in my essay I even said, um, you know, I, I don't have astronomy coursework, but I do have these skills. Um, so maybe not out yourself as someone who doesn't tick the boxes, um, but you know, yeah. So I, I guess the the short version is I don't know if I really have advice. For me, it just it, it was just it just took once for me to get over that. Well, I think what I find so amazing about you is that you even said in your story you failed the first time for Green Bank. Is that correct? So mm -hmm. and so you applied again and. Uh, they talk a lot about that for for women and girls and having grit and um, and not giving up. Uh, you know, it, it, those are the stories that people don't want to share a lot about, which is how many times they got denied <laughs> entry into something. Um, you know, you you hear about it maybe when uh, people. Uh, only recently, I guess, when people are applying to be an astronaut and that, you know, we're excited that they finally became an astronaut, but they, we don't really hear about how many times they applied to become an astronaut over the years and all the calls um, that it, it took a lot of, um, of failing and, and not getting in and, and, and knows to that. Um, I think it's great that you still persevered. Well, what do you, where do you think you got that from? I mean, were there any role models or influences that you had growing up that kind of gave you that grit? Um, I think... One thing that comes immediately to mind is um, I worked at a grocery store in high school and I used to get so angry because I would show up on time all the time and there would be people who frequently um, would not show up on time. They'd sleep in, they didn't want to show up for their 7 a.m. shift, um, but they would still get scheduled for more hours than me. And that really made me upset. And I was complaining about it to my parents and they were like, well, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Like basically you need to ask for things to get them. And I felt too timid to ask for, um, for more hours. I felt if I deserved them, I would receive them. But I was watching people who, um, you know, not just once didn't show up, but would like, every other week leave me alone on a Saturday morning to open the store. Um, get more hours than me. So 
it definitely wasn't because they were reliable. It's it's because they were asking. Um, and I think that that has really stuck with me is that sometimes you're you're not going to be recognized just because you're good at something. You really do have to ask for things. Um, so I think that that was a big thing. Um, and when I was in college, I started to realize um, that sometimes the I started to hear stories about non-traditional paths um, or what seemed to be non-traditional paths. So I didn't know about what what PhDs were growing up. Um, I didn't understand what grad school was. I learned about that late in my graduate um, career. So when I first learned about grad school and being a professor, it sounded like you had to go to grad school immediately and then you had to immediately get a professorship or else you wouldn't be able to be a professor. But I was talking to one of my undergraduate advisors um, and she talked about leaving for um, for industry before going to grad school and that just kind of blew my mind that you could take a gap and do other things um, and that started to um, show me that like there is no one path so i think that was also really important is to realize that there's not just one path it, it is really important that uh, i mean my background is science and art too i didn't even mention that to you earlier but um i also took that root of science and art because i like to uh use that in my education outreach visual communication um, that's the way I appreciate learning. I loved all your little drawings in your PowerPoint that you you put that little personal touch in there. Did you? I'm assuming you drew the map as well. No, that one I I, I just I stole. Yeah. Of, of it's the great. Research. <laughs> but thank you, thinking I could do it. Yeah, I think you bring all these skills to the table, and um, they don't necessarily all have to be these sort of. I don't know how to describe them. I don't know if it considered not, you know. Um, you know, just science where people think we have to be pure scientists. Um, we have like lots of other interests too. And if I'm, if I'm honest, one of my first job was also working in a grocery store, like you mentioned. Um, and I also used to be an import record buyer in San Francisco. So, <laughs> so um, you know, all those things, perhaps those are things that I share with students as well here that it, it might not be a linear path, which is great if some people have linear paths to success and um, to, to know if they knew what they really wanted to do. I also think it's been fun, um, like, like you have in being open to like uh, maybe the unknown in some way. Like, I wonder if I just kind of take this leap off here, what will, what will I learn? Um, and I don't know if that's what you thought you were doing. I think actually you had a, an interest and I wonder, um, would you do anything differently? If you, how, what would happen? Why didn't you know about astronomy you think earlier? And if you could do it all over again, would you go the astronomy route? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um... So I think the reason why I didn't know about astronomy really earlier is because um, at my high school, it wasn't offered. Yeah, I don't think that there were any astronomy courses, science courses offered. Um, and I don't know if I would have done, if I would have gone the astronomy route, at least in undergrad, because uh, my mom was an administrative assistant at Dickinson. So I got free tuition and they don't have astronomy as a major. <laughs> Um, so I don't think I would have been majoring in astronomy so I could avoid the student debt, um, but maybe I would have gone a more physics route. Um, yeah, because when, when I started out in, in grad school, I, I think I, in high school, I had made a list of all the types of scientists I was interested in being, and it was like 50 things, like marine biologist was on there, volcanologist, um, botanist, like, I was just interested in so many things like that. I just like read casually in books, but I didn't really know much about it. I was more like, oh, this sounds like it could be cool. Um, so that's why I chose chemistry. So maybe if I had heard about radio astronomy a little bit earlier, um, because that that was interesting on a whole new level to me, um, I, I might have changed. Um, but um, I mean, from where I am now, I don't think I would have changed anything. Um, I'm. <laughs> which I would not have said five years ago. Um, so when I when I graduated from undergrad, I felt like I had a good idea for what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Um, I felt like I had a good career, good career plan. And the more that, or the longer I've been out of undergrad, the more I've learned about other things that I didn't know existed, like the position I'm in today. So like, I never thought that I would have done 
this. So I almost feel like I'm unlearning in a way. And that's been really fun. It's been an adventure and it's, it's made me learn things that, yeah, like I, I did not know that this position existed until maybe a year ago, like shortly before I applied. So that's a good point. I mean, I think things are changing a lot. Like I mentioned to you when I worked at NASA, it was the earth and space uh, science laboratory, which it had been, you know, probably since its inception. And now it's like part of the astrobiology Institute. So that's all, even though, I mean, it's relatively new astrobiology is definitely a very huge growing field, um, very fast and growing. Um, and I was, it, I was really cool to learn that you were doing analogs um, in your laboratory work. And um, that's some work that I've done actually <laughs> with NASA, which are our Mars analogs. Um, cool. So very, very interesting. We should, uh, we should uh, <laughs> have some virtual tea. <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> I wanted to get to a couple of Q&A questions. I know we're running a little bit late. Do you think you have a couple more minutes? To, yes, I do. Uh, okay, great. Karina asks, what are, your, what are you most excited about going into research uh, on astrochemical ices in the lab? Um, and she also asked, did you ever end up auditing or taking an astro course? But I suppose if they didn't, um, uh, or did you pick up stuff along the way? Like, I guess auditing is something you could do at your university, but if, did, I don't know if Dickinson allowed that or anything, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I'll answer that one first and then I'll get to the most excited one. Um, so yeah, I didn't audit any courses. I wanted to, I wanted to audit um, astronomy courses. So astronomy is offered as a minor um, at Dickinson. So that means that if you take, I think like six courses, you can get a little thing on your degree that says that you did some astronomy coursework. Um, but because there's only one or two astronomy courses offered at any one time, and sometimes there are no astronomy courses. Um, when I went abroad, I missed my last opportunity to take any astronomy courses. Um, so when I came back, there were no astronomy courses being offered in my last year. So I didn't audit any courses there. Um, when I was in grad school, I took some planetary science courses that were related to astrochemistry. So two of them were taught by my advisor. So one was about um, cosmochemistry um, and another one was about spectroscopy. Um, which is a technique used to look at the chemistry in space. Um, so those were classes that I actually enrolled in in graduate school. But um, before that, I had never taken an astronomy course. Like the, the closest thing I had to um, astronomy education, I guess, was reading some books when I was like seven um, about the solar system. Um, and then um, the rest was learning along the way. So when I worked at Harvard doing astrochemistry work, my advisor there gave me a PDF of a paper, a review article that I could read. And it was um, a summary of all the research that had been done on um, what are called complex organic molecules uh, in space up to that point. Um, so that's, that's mostly what I've done is, is the learning along the way. Um, the thing that I'm most excited about uh, for my research at NASA is um, right at the end of my PhD, I found some really cool signals in my telescope data, and I tried to explain what was happening chemically, but so far the laboratory work and the um, simulations of chemistry in space can't explain exactly what's going on. So I have a hypothesis for what's happening based on the existing literature, and I'm really hoping that during my postdoc, I can use the laboratory work to better explain my observations. Um, so I think that's the thing I'm most excited about. Um, but besides that, it's making connections with people. I've already met so many amazing people um, and learning about about new science. So I mean, I, I've been I just finished up my fourth week and every day I learn something new. And that's something that's really scary because there's still a lot to learn, but it's also really exciting. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing all of that in your experience. Uh, but I want to thank you uh, and everyone who's been with us uh, this whole week. Um, so that's it for our, our week of women and girls in astronomy. I would like to thank all our guest speakers for their contribution to it, which included Camille Lorfing from UCL at 
um, MSSL in Surrey, Dr. Ritika Joshi from University of Norway in Oslo, Professor Claudia Marison from the University of Portsmouth, Dr. Joe Barstow from the Open University, and of course, today's guest, Dr. Olivia Harper Wilkins from NASA Goddard. None of this would be possible without your contribution and participation, and we thank you very much for it. And it has been wonderful hearing from you all, and it is not lost on us that we need more of this, which is sharing the stories and successes, and sometimes the struggle, the pitfalls of that path of women and girls in astronomy and space science. And thank you uh, for being with us. And until next time, goodbye, everyone. <laughs>